Good morning. Good morning, How are you, Remy. Not too bad. Good. Feels a little like deja vu this morning. We, we, we had this conversation <laughs> yesterday and filmed it. In fact, it just wasn't particularly success, successful. Yes, we did, folks. Uh, Remy and I are trying to get ourselves organized and um, on more of a schedule. And because we're moving away from doing the Facebook Lives and we're going to solely Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon, I think I said that wrong, um, and YouTube, we're pre-recording our videos to make sure we can edit out anything that we have go might pop up wrong. And yesterday we recorded an hour and 10 minute conversation between Remy and I early in the morning, once again, and we get done and I called her and I was like, I don't know if I liked it. I felt a little uncomfortable and it's so crazy to me because I feel after thinking about Remy, I'm, I felt, I don't know. I, um, why is this such a weird topic for me to talk about? Maybe, I don't know. I, I think it's because you have to recognize that you have success and not think that that's the end of it. And you know, we, we usually talk for more for, before each of our episodes and we didn't talk that much before that one yesterday. <laughs> and so it was a little loose, even for us, it was a little loose. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, round two, um, welcome. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to coffee with the cowgirls. I'm Brett Kruger and I'm Remy Greer. And we're going to talk about some of the parts of success today. Yes. Um, just a little housekeeping. Remy, we've get, been getting a ton of cowgirl fan mail and it's been amazing. Um, if you have sent us stuff, thank you. If you haven't and you like what we're doing, please, please reach out to us. We love receiving uh, the emails, the messages, the calls. Um, it's been a lot of fun reading those and listening to those over the last couple weeks. Um, all right, so we are going to dive in today and Hopefully this will be a little bit more of a flowing conversation compared to yesterday. <laughs> uh, so I think that first we should start off with the definition of success because it is something that's definitely changed over time. Um, I looked up the definition of success in the old dictionary and I think that that is what we all tend to think of what success is. It's the definition of success in the Webster's Dictionary is wealth, fame, and respect. Um, but I would say- We're live our, right now, FYI. Oh, we are. We are, again. People are watching. <laughs> How do you know this? <laughs> it says live up in my corner. Oh. <laughs> Interesting enough, uh, it did say record only when I touched the button, though. Okay. So saying. I hope that if we're live, good morning, everybody out there. <laughs> um, but going back, uh, the old defin or the new definition is not tied to money, which I think that most of us would think success is tied to money. Yeah. So when you were younger, what did you think was success? Like, what was your path to success? What was your end goal for success? Um, for me, it definitely success was the American dream success. You knew that you were successful. If you graduated high school, you left home, you went to college, you got a diploma, diploma, you got out of college, uh, you got, the greatest job ever um, and you worked that nine to five and you gave your life to that job um, you had kid you got married you had kids you had you bought the house you did all the things and had all the things that was what success I thought it was yeah and I, you know you and I have talked about we have a we have a different background so I went to a high school that um, you had to be enrolled in college to graduate. And so that their cover letter could say you had a 100% matriculation rate, right? Everyone was- Say that again now. What did you just say? So where I went to high school, um, you were 
you were supposed to be enrolled in college by the time you left, right? Their cover sheet when they sent it out to schools would say that they had a hundred percent matriculation rate. Everyone that mm-hmm. graduates as high school goes to college. And that's the school was geared for it. And the other thing is for me growing up, I didn't have an option. You weren't gonna not go to I mean, yes, I had an option, but we you, you every goal was that you were gonna go to college. And we probably weren't gonna stop at college, we we're gonna go to graduate school. And so that was, that was a different kind of thing, right? Like I grew up thinking I was going to be a professor or a lawyer. That's where I was going to end up. So my whole, my whole plan was, that was my whole plan. And I, I was lucky because I didn't have to worry about ever starving to death. And I don't really mean starving to death, you know, but I, I had full parental support all the time. College was where you were going. And, and again, graduate school after that. So in a lot of ways, what I've chosen to do is, it's kind of a disappointment because I, my senior year in college, I wrote my thesis, I turned it in and I never looked back and I had applied to graduate schools. I'd gotten into graduate schools and I remember like coming out of the stacks in the library. And, so for uh, you too, that was your definition of success. It, it, it was, it was just, it was like, there wasn't another option. It was just, you were going to go to college and you, again, and it was a step farther. You're going to go to graduate school. You were going But that's to how you measured success oh, yeah. because that if you didn't measure it, then you wouldn't have thought you were a failure if you didn't go to graduate school. Yeah. And so then you come out of there. And then the other thing for me as success, because there, I, I didn't have to struggle when I was younger. And I, I mean, I've struggled as an adult, but not really, not truly struggled. Right. I, I've never wor- been worried about my lights been turning off or eating like that's never been part of our struggle. But, you know, so knowing those things like it wasn't just the measure. It wasn't a measure of success about going to graduate school. It's just what you did, right? That was going to be what you did. It wasn't, that was what made you successful. That was what you were going to do. So for me, success then got turned into competition. I am going to be the best at anything that I do, no matter what. Yeah, I think that that's the reason why yesterday was so hard for us, Remy, to be honest with you, is because we view success on different Mm -hmm. levels or in different arenas because I you view success as more from a competition standpoint and I view success from more of a life standpoint does that make sense yeah and I I, as I've gotten older I've viewed it that way too but I think it's because some of so many of those things for me that you were talking about like uh you want to get out of your hometown right I was going to get out of my hometown that was that was a given I was going to go do big things. And like, that sounds so conceited. That was a given too. Okay. We're going to do those things. No problem. You don't have to worry. So for me, because certain things that were going to be seen as successes for a large part of the population for the group that I grew up in was just a given that was going to happen for you. And so then you become, so then you become focused on success in a different way, right? How am I the best at everything I do? And when I was younger, I was a national level gymnast. And then I showed hunters and jumpers and then we started penning. So it's competition after competition after competition. It was a very definitive marker of success. I won. I am better. I am good. Or I am the best. Yeah. And that becomes part of your personality, right? Like I have to be now. Now I have to be the best. Not just, I want to be the best. I have to be the best. Yes. I think this is where we were trying to get to yesterday and we could not get there. Um, you know, yeah, I, I mean, I come up from a family, there's four of us siblings and we've all went to college. Um, I was definitely the youngest. I am probably the most rebellious out of the group. Um, the most stubborn, I am the black sheep. Uh, and I I mean, I, it was a given that I was going to go to college. I mean, my dad was not going to let me do anything other than that. Um, but I did not, I never felt like I belonged in that small town. Um, And not that I like big cities or anything, but I just never felt like I had my people. And so I could not wait to get out of there. The day that I graduated, I was gone. Um, And I showed horses growing up. I mean, competitively, not team penning and ranch sorting. Growing up for me, I showed POAs, Arabians, quarter horses. And I did that. Um, I I was doing all around stuff back then. Uh, English, Western pleasure, all of it. Uh, And it was never, well, I was always riding a bunch of young horses too. I was catch riding the Arabians. So a lot of them were horses that I'd never rode before. 
And I mean, I was doing really well, but I never, I never felt, it was never about, I don't know how to explain it. It was just never about that for me. Yeah. And I mean, so I grew up riding hunters and jumpers and um, catch riding everything too. But it was the same thing. I didn't just want to win on my pony or on my Eckhorse or my junior hunter. I wanted to win the first three spots, right? I wanted to be dominant in what I was doing. And, and that's a bad cycle to be in a lot of times when you are measuring your value by how your worth. Yeah, you're worth by how successful you are. And it's part of the reason that you end up hustling as an adult because you are used to being successful. Um, and then when you're not successful, you pick apart why you weren't successful, which is good in a lot of ways. It can also be a very bad cycle. But, you know, then I got older and it didn't matter because success for me isn't measured the same way anymore, right? Am I happy in what I do? Yeah, I'm really happy in what I do. I have a great family. I have great clients. We have a lot of cows, but it isn't about, it isn't about the business. It isn't about the money part of the business or the money part of the cows anymore. It's that those are things that I like to have around me. And I like to give back more. And I like to care more about other people than I used to when I was younger. And it makes me happy, you know, and it is successful. I'm comfortable in the success. It doesn't mean that I stop. It doesn't mean I try, don't try and get better, but I'm comfortable in what I have. And that is a different definition of success than I had at 17 or 25 or 30 or even at 35. And don't get me wrong. I love to win. I don't really care to lose, but uh, I've never let the wins or losses define my worth. And I think that we did a really good job just explaining that. So. <laughs> no, and it, I think too, it's like you, you look back and I can tell you a lot of times why I lost. And there's a couple big wins in my mind. And I won a lot, but there's still only a few big wins in my mind that really matter. And a lot of those matter because the people I won with, like, um, we had a client one time, they asked, like, so do you put on your new belt buckle every time? Well, no, I really wear my cow palace buckle from a long time ago. All, oh my like, God, Remy. I like, was thinking of that same story. Like 90% my... of the time, because I want it, it used to, it was like one of the last straight open team pennings. And for those of you that don't know what team penning and ranch sorting are, they're, bo they're horse and cattle sports um, that kind of replicate what you do as far as ranch work. But we won the team penning in Cow Palace. Um, it was, like I said, one of the last big open shows that you could go to. You had to qualify at like six o'clock in the morning in San Francisco, right on the coast. It's foggy and it's cold. And I won it with um, my husband, James, and Shelly Fitzgerald. It was just a really, really big win. I wear that buckle all the time. It means the most. It does. It means the most to me. That is so funny that you brought that up because when I was cleaning stalls the other day and thinking about what we were going to talk about during this, um, because I knew I just couldn't, I couldn't put it all together because I knew in my head that we thought about success differently at first in our lives. And I knew that we had to go there and it's because of you were looking at it at the arena and I look at it as life. And, but I was thinking about that and I was like, I have won quite a few buckles over my little life and I only wear one. And the one that I wear, I mean, I, I don't even know if it's a, it was just a big feat for me, I guess, because when I met Brandon, I rode pleasure horses my whole life and his family was into cutters, high end cutters. And his dad bought me this little mare. Her name was Ketchalina star. She was a little tiny thing. She barely made 13 hands, um, which for me coming from POAs, it was awesome. And she was gritty and just tough as nails. And his mom, and if you've met Brandon's mom, she doesn't ride. She's gritty and tough as nails. She's a competitor. She likes to win. Brandon's mom, Brandon's dad taught me how to cut. And then Brandon's mom was hauling me around to all the shows. Just her and I. I was 20 something, didn't really know what I was doing, didn't know how to pick cattle, but it didn't really matter because Marge is like a bull in a china shop. So we'd get there to the cuttings and she'd just walk up, she'd pick out my turn back riders and tell them what they needed to know about me and away we go. And I won a 2000 limited buckle 
um, the limit 2000 limited rider buckle uh, that year, just her and I going down the road together and we didn't really go to many shows. Um, but that was when cutting was pretty big in Minnesota. That's the only buckle I wear. See, and, they, and there is, there's certain significance. It doesn't matter that it was like for me, Cal Palos was big because it was, it was like the last of the big open things, but it wasn't because we were winning an open. It was just like the last of its kind. So we won it. And we talk about bucket list shows for James and I. Now James's last bucket list show really to win is Houston, but we've never gone. And then Calgary, he's won everything else he really wants to win. And again, right, when you're younger, there's all these things that you want to have the buckles from. Well, we went to Denver and you won Denver. Like all those things, ma they, they matter and they don't matter, but they're things in your right. head that are markers of success for you. And he's accomplished a lot of those. I think that it becomes like when you talk about success from an arena standpoint, there becomes a turning point in your life where you still are so competitive and you want the win but it doesn't mean what it meant to you at a certain point in your life anymore does that make sense well it's like so um we used to be mercenaries man like you if there was a show without it many we got in the truck and we went and we craved it and now it's you know Okay, so we want to ride with our kids and we want to be successful with our kids. We don't want to put pressure on them, but we want to go ride with them and have fun as a family. Yeah. But, you know, you can have a big show with a lot of added money. And if I want to go to the beach that weekend, I'm going to go to the beach. I just don't care about proving my worth. Because the other thing is when you use that as a marker of success, it's really hard to stay on top. It's easy to get to. I mean, I say that, but it's pretty easy to get to the top. It's really hard to stay there. And I just don't crave living in the truck anymore. I don't crave going to shows anymore. I don't, well, you know, it's just different. It's different. I'd rather hang out with my, I like my kids. I like my husband. I'd rather hang out at home than go, than go compete for a living. And that's what we did for a long time. So that brings me, well, so going back to the new definition of success, the new definition is work that leaves you feeling fulfilled and satisfied or work that allows you to control your own destiny. Um, but with what you just said, you said we used to crave doing that. And um, which leads me kind of to my next little topic, because there's a shift on, pe on how people view success. We just talked about that. The money, the fame is the old definition. The new definition is more about, you know, creating your own way, own path, doing your own thing, being you. Um, uh, because I go back to the way the people where I wanted to go with this is when you think about um, the old definition of money or success with the money, the fame, the respect, you think about all the people that you know, Remy, who have it all or what you perceive as all, which if you were somebody who loved to show horses and you see that person going down the road every weekend because they crave it, usually there's a lot of other things that you maybe don't see or you maybe miss. I mean, um, because there's a lot of pitfalls that come with all of that. It's really hard to keep a family together when you're craving something that hard. Uh, no so it's, it's it's one of those things right you again you can't judge someone's winning season when you aren't there for their losing season the other thing is you don't realize what it takes for anyone to be successful in any sort of business so when you hear you know when you see um when you see a guy going down the road with a big truck and trailer okay are they in debt or are they not in debt do they choose to be in that debt for that truck and trailer or that really fancy car that they're driving so for us, we drive around in a, not an old truck, but an older truck and a stock trailer because there's no incurred debt and it's useful to us both in our horse business and our cattle business. Now, the money that we could spend on a bigger rig, we invest other places. And you hear about it with people with cars, right? They're going to have the giant car payment so that they look, they have this, they have the trappings of success, the trappings of wealth, right? They've got the big cars, so they must be doing well. Well, they're just making a pay. Most of them are just making a payment. 
where they could have invested some of that money a little more wisely. Now, if they want to be happy driving that car, awesome. But if you would be happier in five years with all the money you saved on a cheaper car payment because you invested it wisely, well, then that probably would have been a better option. And again, if you're worried about the look of success versus being actually successful, then you have to have that conversation with yourself or your partner or your friends, really, to figure out, do you want to look successful or do you want to be successful? I would say that we are in the same category as James and Remy uh, with we put our money into our business, uh, things that can make us money, um, which we're choosing and chose not to take on a ton of debt because that's not, it's not what matters to us, I guess. But if you truly look, okay, so we're, we are people who, don't get me wrong, neither one of us goes without food. We've got shelter over our head warm bed to sleep in. We have all of the things that you need to live a comfortable life. Either one of us have went without anything. Would you say, Remy? No, oh, 100%. 100%. Mm -hmm. If you look at the people who, and I can say I'm a victim of it, I look at people who I have looked. I may continue to look still. I don't know. Um, it's easier for me to look past them now and be like, uh, I have everything that I want or need. Um, but I've looked at people and been like, oh my gosh, like I would love to have what they have. And I guarantee you that nine out of 10 times, the people that I'm looking at and saying that look at me and say, I want what she has because the difference is I probably live a simpler life and I have a better relationship with my family, my husband, my kids. You know, and so going back to, you know, when we talk to you in the podcast about struggling, right? Like it, everyone has a different level of struggle. So we talk about if we all have a gallon of water to carry, some of us can carry it in a five gallon bucket and some of us only have a thimble to carry it in. And that makes it easier when you figure out that people's, people's lives are harder for them, even if you don't think it's hard. So when I was, when I went to school and in college, like I said, I didn't really have to worry about, um, you know, I wasn't having to worry about incurring debt from college loans. My parents paid for college, but I was lucky in that James also worked really hard. So he started a nursery and um, a landscaping business. And so I'd go to school and I'd come home and I'd fix strip lines in the nursery because for us, he wasn't just going to have a landscaping business. If we were going to pay for trees, then we were going to grow trees. And now where our grow lot is for our cattle, that was a nursery. Like it was boxes and gallons of trees out in the front. And I remember I was in college and so we were young and uh, he was putting these yards in and then, and then mowing the yards. And we saw these guys were our same age with a brand new house, putting in you know, an expensive landscaping job and paying for landscaping. And they had the toy trailer and the desert toys and a boat. And I'm just like, how do these people afford everything? And now I know it was on borrowed money because most <laughs> of those guys lost everything. But again, when you're in your early twenties and you see these guys just spending money you're like, what kind of job do they have? I want that job. Like, I thought I was lucky, but what are they doing? And again, like, you can get caught up in that and trying to keep up with everyone. And when you stop looking over the fence or stop, and it's it's okay to admire. It's just not okay to be super jealous because you don't know the cost of whatever it is. And that's not just a financial cost. That's an emotional cost. It's a spiritual cost. It's a mental cost. If you don't know what that cost is, then admire it for what it is and move on with your life because that's not the measure of your success. And the other thing is like, we've talked about it too. I struggled in different ways because, because I was comfortable, we struggled in different ways. We wanted to be successful. That means that we put everything back into the business. It means that James, when landscaping took a hit with the economy going down, he put his head down and went to work as a shoer. And so it's like, you look back at some of those times and there was a struggle. Like what's, you've talked about it, but you can talk about it again. Like. What are some of the things you remember about your first house or your first instance living with Brandon that could have broken some people or made other weaker people just be like, yeah, this is not for me. This life isn't for me. Let's move on. Well, before I tell that story, I should clarify that I'm now some people may not know this about me, but I'm the biggest tight ass that you've ever seen in your life, Remy. <laughs> I mean, I don't do well with big numbers. Um, I like to 
shop off the sales rack. I shop a lot of vintage places, secondhand. That's just the beginning. Ask any of my friends. I freaking held on to doing or held off on doing a bathroom remodel for almost a year and a half because, and it needed it bad, didn't have a bathroom door. Um, but I did not want to spend the money. So I am the biggest tight ass. All of my money is in my barn. That's where I like it. Um, so when we came out of college, our first house, we had the sale barn, um, just horse sales there, but that was our barn and it was on the edge of town. So like when I say edge, I mean, it was in town, the sale barn was, and, uh, Brendan and I kept all of our horses there and there was, a a Western, it went, we had a little house that sat at the front of the driveway. There was a Western store behind our house. And then there is the um, sale barn behind the Western store. Now the sale or the Western store also doubled as a trailer lot. They had trailer sales. So they'd have trailers parked all around my house to the point where at two o'clock in the morning, one time I was going to the bathroom and I looked out the window and there was somebody looking at a trailer that was parked right by my bathroom window. And, um, God, we lived there for longer than I'd actually like to admit. It was like six years. And I never really thought about it. I mean, we always kind of joked about that we lived in the sale barn house, um, but it was so cheap to live there. It was $300 a month. We were able to save up a lot of money and I really don't care where I live. Um, my dream has never been the big fancy house. Uh, now I do, I wish that I was, um, the pioneer woman and a mixture of the pioneer woman and Martha Stewart. Hell yes, I do. I really do. I am the person who's got the Pinterest board that everything is trapped on. It will never come to life on my board. I wish I was that person, but I will never be that person. So I've never dreamt of having the big fancy house that's all clean. Um, it's just not me. So I was okay living in that because I knew that there was an end goal in game. And the goal was to save money to get a farm. Because when you're in your early 20s, you don't have $30,000 to put a down payment down. And that is what you need to buy a farm. You have to have $30,000 cash. That, that's that, that's cute. That is not what you need in California. <laughs> oh, I know. You need like, probably 100000 I don't know. <laughs> But when you're 22, you do not have that kind of money. Um, and we had, nobody was going to give us that money to do that. So we had to save our pennies to get there. And uh, we lived in that house for six years. I would have to wear muck boots to go down into the basement to do my laundry because there was always that much of water in the basement at all times. My washer and dryer were on pallets. Um, and... When we moved out of there, I cried because I knew that that house was a stepping stone. Um, and ultimately, that freaking house made me tough as fucking nails. And that house did more good for us than we ever did for it. But I'll never forget when my family came to visit and they're like, holy shit, you live here? I'm like, yeah, you can't stay here with me. <laughs> No, and I, so it was like, I remember when James and I got our first apartment, so we signed the lease and we go and it's just this little two bedroom apartment. And uh, I remember laying down on the bedroom floor, like there's nothing in there, right? We signed the lease, we got the keys and just being like, this is ours, right? Like we don't own it, fair enough, it was a lease, but it's like, this is ours, this is our own space you to, do with, to do whatever we want with. And you know, it's, it's, but that was hard too, because then, we weren't living at the ranch. We were driving back and forth and yeah, it was nice to have space. But then at the same time, you start thinking about, okay, well now we're paying a lease on a place that we'll never own. And we're not, you know, it's, it's not, and again, it's not cheap in California, even for that, that wasn't that cheap, <laughs> but um, you know, those were good times. It was just us by ourselves. And we ended up living that in, in that apartment complex. So we moved one time in the middle when we lived there because we wanted to be upstairs. We didn't want to have elephant feet on top of us for neighbors, which is what <laughs> happens when you live in an apartment. And uh, I remember my brother came and helped us move and we literally moved from one building to the next. And he goes, I will help you move across the country. I will not yeah. help you move across the parking lot ever again. Because it was just, you know, we we're going to carry it upstairs, but it was ours. It was our own place. And then we had Kyle, 
while we lived in that apartment and when I was pregnant with Braden, we ended up moving back to the ranch. But, you know, that that made us too. But it, and that became that became more of a struggle because now we had other bills that we had to pay that we really had to pay that you couldn't put off and you had to be responsible for. And it, but it was it was all yours. If you failed, it was on your shoulders. If you were successful, it was because of something you did. It wasn't because yeah. of something else. And the other thing, like, I, I mean, I've had some conversations with people and, you know, it's kind of like what Taylor talked to you about. And I got another message from another girlfriend of mine about finding your path and what the struggle is. Remember when we tell you that the struggle is what makes you? It is. It is what makes you. But at the same time, when you're in that struggle, it's fucking hard, man. It sucks. You can't see your way out of it. You're trying not to drown. You don't know what's going to happen. And it feels sometimes like there's no light at the end of that tunnel. So when we tell you to muscle through, it sucks. Trust me. I remember how bad it sucks. I you know remember, what? you know, I remember going to like, and um, there's a team roper on TikTok. They, and they take all the cattle to the NFR in the world series. Now her name is Steph Hill. And she talks about coming home broke from the NFR and they had to like find change in their truck to pay to get out of the valley, you know, to get their, uh, not out of valet, to get their car out of the airport parking. I remember the same thing with James. Like we went, to the NFR, we bought stuff that we needed, right? We needed tack and all this stuff. And I think we did it in a day trip, but I remember coming home and having very little in the bank account, which meant you had to go right back to work to make sure you had money. But that was a great trip. That was such a fun trip, but it, you know, it was scary at the same time and it motivated you. Okay. You better give it to work because now you've spent money <laughs> that maybe you didn't really have. Yeah. You know, um, the struggle is, it is so, it's hard and you have to be mentally tough, prepared, which I'll be very honest. I'm not some days. That's the reason Brandon and I work so good together because even when he's scared, he doesn't show it because he knows that I can't handle. If he, if he was scared, then we'd really be, it'd be a shit show. Um, so he doesn't show it. But uh, if you don't have that struggle for those, those people who've reached out to us and said, you know, show us a path or whatever, um, if, if you don't have a struggle at some point in your life, then your dreams are definitely not big enough. So, cause it and comes with it. You don't learn from success either. You don't. Lot, right? Like it's the same. It doesn't matter if it's in an arena situation life. or if it's in life, right? If everything goes your way, good for you. Look, look, awesome. Good for you. I'm super happy for you, yeah. but you, you don't learn, you don't learn who you are. You don't learn what you're capable of. You don't learn how to be better. You don't learn how to not fail. And sometimes you'll fail even when you know better. Um, you don't learn those things through success. You learn them through losing. You learn, learn, learn you learn it through failure, you know, and, yeah. uh, and, and it's too, the other thing that happens with success, especially and this is speaking to our younger viewers, right? When you tell people what you want to do and it isn't following the linear path of go to college, get a degree, get a job, get a 401k, get benefits, get insurance, get all those things, right? When you tell people a path that diverges from them, it scares them in two ways. If they care about you, it scares them for you. What if you fail? Finally, yeah. Right? The other thing is if you think in a different way than other people, that scares them too, right? They don't understand it. They don't know how to make sense of that. And they're going to try and crush your dreams, really. And it goes back to that whole who's in your circle. I was just going to say, I feel like the, the episodes that we've had, who's in your circle, what's holding you back, that all ties into what we're talking about today. I feel like we did a really good job with that, not even knowing it. No, because it is true, right? To be successful, you have to, first of all, believe in yourself. Going back to having friends, they need to violently believe in you too and violently support your beliefs. Or you have to be okay with walking away, away from, from people that your don't. circle. Yeah. Yeah. I talked to someone yesterday and she had a really big thing happen. She was super successful and phone blew up with text messages. And then right away, she wasn't so successful and no one really reached out to her after that. And I said, that should make a lot of things very clear to you about who's in your circle and who really cares. You know, and I think that there's something to be said about when you're transitioning into 
doing something that is out of the norm of social standards, you have to be okay with being alone. Um, you have to be okay with being alone. Sometimes not telling if you're not prepared for what you know, um, your mom or dad or close friend is going to say about what your dream is, then don't tell them in my opinion. I mean, because, well, I mean, when I was going to quit my job, I did not confer with any of my family besides Brandon because I know or I knew that they would be like, are you sure? Oh my God, do not do that. You need, you need the 401k. You need the benefits. You need this. You need that. I did not confer with them. I had made it up in my mind that I was quitting my job and I did it. I told them after it was done because I knew I probably was not prepared for what they were going to say. And they were totally cool with it. It was fine. Um, and it wouldn't have mattered if they weren't fine with it because it's my life. But you get to a certain point. Age tells you that you really don't give a shit what, the, what they think because you're going to live your life. I shouldn't say I give a shit what they think, but I'm not going to let it stop me anymore from doing yeah. things. So I think like when you're really young, right, you don't care for the most part, you don't care what people think. And then you hit this age and it is it's late teens, early 20s where you're stepping out into being your own person. And so you try and listen to advice and you can either start to take advice from everyone and get caught in not making any decisions because you listen to too yes. many people. Or you can take the if you if you're smart, you can listen to what they're saying and understand the motivations behind what they're saying. Are they afraid for you? Okay, that's okay. If you're afraid for me, I can listen to your advice. I might not take it, but at least it's coming from a place of love, right? Um, are they afraid because you're doing something different and they haven't seen that before and it makes them uncomfortable because a lot of people are uncomfortable with you not following that path? Okay, so I know your motivation there too. And then you get, but you have to still listen to what do you want to do? Now, I am a big advocate for going to college because it leaves a door open. Now, I know college isn't for everyone, but for me, like it's it's a big door that stays open. I think vocational schools are great too, but I tell people, I'm like, even if you don't want to go to college full time, go and take a semester at a junior college, figure out if it is for you. If it's not for you, don't waste your time or money. Don't waste your professor's time. Don't waste your parents' time. It doesn't have to be for you, but don't close the door because, you know, you don't think it's for you. And that's, you know, and it's, but for me, like that's, that's the thing. Right? I, I think college is important. I don't think it's important for everyone. James is not built for college. He tried college a couple of times, not so built Brandon, for it. And it didn't work for him. Yeah. And well, I, so I used to be in the same belief or mindset that you are Remy. And I felt like college was super important. And, you know, even though I didn't like what my dad has to say, had to say to me when I was getting ready to go into college, it is what I would tell other people too, is that you have to have a backup plan. However, with that being said, my thought on college has changed so much. I mean, there are so many amazing trade schools out there for you young people. Oh, and what they can teach you in a short amount of time to get out and start getting into the workforce and do something that's super meaningful is amazing. And your student debt is like, a third of what it is if you go to one, one uh, year of college. Um, and for me, I think too, part of it, why I, why I like college aside from how I was raised is it teaches you to think in a certain way, right? So if college isn't for you, but you like to listen to podcasts or read books or listen to books on tape, you can get a lot of education that I think comes from college. And it's because it's, I, I, I think the best people in life are well-read or, and I say that, and the world's changed, right? You don't read books the same way that you used to read books. But you don't want to, You do, it's hard to carry on a conversation with someone that has nothing in their life except for whatever this little channel is that they've committed to, right? If they only do underwater basket weaving and that's all they can talk to you about. Well, that's kind of boring, right? Yeah. So where, and that's why, I, that's why I say that for me about colleges, go read, and it isn't just college, go read. Go listen to stuff. Go talk to people that don't agree with you and just broaden your worldview. It'll make you a happier person and it'll make you think about problems that you encounter 
differently because if you've only been taught that two plus two equals four, you forget that one plus three equals four too. So go talk to other people, figure out that there's a different way to get to your goal and go see how other people have struggled. That's what I do love about podcasts, right? Is listening to like all the other horrible things that people have been through. Cause you're like, oh, I'm not alone. It wasn't just me that thought that was a good idea. And then it wasn't. Yeah, but like if, okay. So coming from people who listen to a lot of podcasts, like everybody's good story starts at the end of something that was bad or they thought was bad. But going back to circling back to the younger generation who's listening to us, we live in like unprecedented times right now, you guys. We live in a really, well, you can choose to look at it however you want, but I choose to look at it as like, it's acceptable to be different. It's yeah. celebrated to do something out of the norm right now when 20 years ago it was not it was not celebrated or not the cool thing to do to step outside of the box um life is different now there's i mean i came at the end of the gen I, I came at the end of the generation was that you went to college right you got a degree and you'd get hired right out of school yes. like that was i was the end of that because when i came out of school First of all, my degree was not particularly helpful to a lot of people. I have a degree in medieval history and a minor in English and world lit. So I can, I'm super interesting at cocktail parties, but it's not, it doesn't, it's not directly applicable for like the rest of my life. Um, I did not take languages that helped me. You know, I, I took Latin and Italian. I have like eight years of French, a little bit of Russian, um, enough Greek to translate some stuff. That's it. That's all I, you know, I, I was taking a very, like a very concentrated path to, I was going to go to graduate school for medieval history and great. Like that's, that's what I was doing. Remy and, is a uh, scholar compared to me. But I... it's, it, it, and even then I was just like, I, like I said, I got to the end of college and I was like, oh, this was fun. What were you going to do with that, by the way? I was going to be a professor. I was going to, it's like a pyramid scheme. <laughs> I was going to teach other people the same things I knew. Like I, I mean, that's the running joke with a lot of history and <laughs> soft sciences it's like a pyramid scheme it's like oh, i can't get a real job so i'm gonna get a job teaching other people the same things i know so they can't get a job mm. and it's not just about a job i like <laughs> look, i loved what i love what i studied i still love what i study i think it's very applicable when you talk about things it it shapes my world view in a lot of ways because a lot of things haven't changed and uh so Ruby somewhere. went to school. She followed the path. Like I followed the path and then you come out and it's like, okay. And I'm like, you know, I applied for jobs and it's like, well, you got, you're too educated. What do you have a college degree and you want to work here for? I don't know. I just need a job. I want, I want money. I want to buy things. I want to eat. I want money. Uh, you, we won't hire you. You're too educated. And then you go other places. Like, oh no, now you need a master's degree. And I was like, I got the degree. I did the things. <laughs> so now I either got to do more things or less things. I don't know what to do. So then I just trained horses because I didn't have to have a degree or not have a degree. And again, look, I think education is super important. It does shape how you think. It shapes how you can talk to people. And uh, yeah, it's great for me. But I did. I, I, I have a degree that does not matter. And I'm not saying like, I love my degree. It's great. College was awesome for me. I just... It's not applicable in the real world. <laughs> and it's it's why so many historians end up being like attorneys or paralegals mm. or judges because you're really good at research, okay? So look, I could read, I used to have to read just ridiculous amounts of text a week and put it down to all the salient points. I'm good at that, not in conversation apparently, but like in general, I can <laughs> I can do that. But you know, so Remy has got a degree in med medieval um, history. history. That's me. That's me. I have a degree in ag business, but yet I also failed college algebra twice. Not once, twice. But um, I was really, I was, I learned a lot of social skills in college, Remy. So there's that. And we talked yesterday, um, you know, so you can be the best horse trainer out there. You, if, if that's what your passion is, you can be the best horse trainer out there. But if you have no social skills and you can't talk to people, does not matter, but that is life. It doesn't matter what you do in life. You have got to have good social skills. No, and it's it's one of those things too, where it's like you, and you have to find the people 
that admire something in you. Yeah. Especially when you're like, like as an entrepreneur or someone that's working on their own, you don't, doesn't matter. It's again, it doesn't matter how good your product is, how good you are. If you can't talk to people and if you can't make them feel some way about themselves, you don't have repeat business. Now, some people like the, the big thing about horse trainers is there's three types of successful horse trainers. Ones that win all the time, especially I grew up and race horses. That's very important winning all the time. <laughs> so the first type is the one that wins all the time. The second type is the one that makes you feel really good about yourself. And the third one is the one that helps you win and or, or, slash wins and makes you feel good about yourself. So I try and be the third kind because we're not all going to win. I realize that now I didn't realize it as much as when I was younger, but you have to make people feel good about themselves. And that is another success, right? Bringing people along with your journey of success. If I win and it only matters to me that I win, I haven't added anything back to anyone's life. I haven't added really anything back to my life. So as you get to be more successful, you start to bring people along with your success. And that opens more doors, not just for money, but for relationships and for growth. And it will make you more successful, I cannot speak English this morning, <laughs> successful in the long run. It's because it's too early. Uh, my brain doesn't function this early. But, you know, when you open your success to other people, more success comes to you and the success is even more satisfying. And you have to recognize uh, even the littlest successes. Um, and it's not even the littlest because... So I think about uh, Brandon had a clinic a couple weeks ago that he did, and um, there was one lady who was at the one prior because he also did one at the same place at the end of May, and he did one at the beginning of July again. So she was at the one at the end of May, and she's a little afraid of her horse. Um, she's just getting into sorting, but she's a little afraid of her horse, and so the first time in May. I don't think that she, she rode her horse, but it was very, for a very small time. And then she had somebody else get on it and ride it and all was well. And then she came back in July and she was on her horse for the entire time, Remy. And I, I can't remember like if she went into the sorting pen, I, I think that she did, but she never got off of the horse to have somebody get on. So it told me that she gained more confidence from the time before, right? So that night I was like, hey, I'm like, today was successful. And <clears throat> she was trying to divert the conversation. Like she didn't want to admit that she had success. And I was like, yes, it was successful. Last time you got off of your horse right away. You were so nervous. You were very scared. Your nerves and your anxiety were much better and under control this time. I didn't see you get off of your horse. You didn't have somebody else riding it. That was success. But she didn't want to recognize it as success, but that was success. She conquered a fear that day. Well, and I think that's part of it too, right? So you don't ever want, talking about why success is hard to talk about. You don't want to sound like, not that that would be conceited on her. You don't want to sound conceited, like, oh, we're successful, right? Because you're trained to, first of all, always think there's more and there is, but the other thing is you're trying to project being humble. Now you can still be humble and be proud of your success. Right. And I think you see that with a lot of people. It's like, Oh, I could have done this better. Okay. Again, it's that whole thimble, the five gallon bucket. Okay. So the first time she had a thimble, well, maybe this time she has a teacup. Great. Yeah. Awesome. And, and celebrate that success because you know, if you look at everything as this gargantuan task, it becomes really impossible to building blocks. Yeah, it's just building blocks, right? It's you can't climb the mountain in one jump. Take steps and be be proud of each success, right? Be proud of each small thing that you accomplished because they all do lead to a bigger goal. And uh, but you know, success it is it's a it, success is tricky. It, it is very tricky, right? Because if you're really driven that success is always just moving, right? So moving, it just, it, I was successful here, but now I got to be successful up here. But and, I'm okay, so, um, it, and as you're, when you're younger, right, those jumps seem bigger. You have to make those jumps. And then now it's like, I'm going to rest at this level for a minute and then I'll move forward. But when you're younger, it's, you see success around you and you're like, man, I got to have that. And I got to have it right now. You know, but I, so I'm going to use like having the nine to five, the job right out of college that, so when I 
got out of, well, when I was in college, I took a job with Lando Lakes Purina. And um, I started with them not right after college, but not far out of college. It was amazing, Remy. Um, I, it was all, I thought, this is all I've ever wanted was this job. So great. I just got what everybody told me that I needed and should have. And I loved it. I did learn a lot. I worked with some amazing people. I do not regret my time there at all. However, um, because of who I am and I just, I wanted to be the best in that circle. And so I worked and worked and worked and, um, the thing about a nine to five and it doesn't matter who you're working for, if you're working for corporate America, whatever, they'll never tell you that you're doing too much. And if you're a driven person, um, you just keep running yourself into the ground mentally, physically, uh, you have to come to a point you yourself do. Nobody can tell you this, that you have to finally decide these people are not coming to visit me in the nursing home when I'm old and gray. And no, for me, you're, you're just a commodity for them, right? Yes. Like you're a commodity. How hard can we work and how much money can I make off of her? And the worst part is when you leave, they just replace you right away. There's no big hole yeah. in their heart. Now your coworkers might have a hole in their heart, but the company doesn't care. When you're fresh out of college, though, you and you're doing good for somebody, you're like, they could never replace me. Yeah, you you understand, like, super fast. Like, yeah, everybody's replaceable. They'll have you replaced by 8 o'clock the next morning. Um, your job is not, or your role in your current job is not that important that they cannot replace you. Um, but I, I woke up one day after... I almost drove my kids um, through the daycare because I was getting up so early and I'd have them dropped off at daycare at 615. And I did it not only once, but I did it twice. And the second time I was like, something has to change. I got to daycare. I got out of my car. I was going to get them and I couldn't even get them out of the, the car seats because the car was rolling into the daycare. Now, did it ever get to the point where it actually hit the building? No. But I knew that mentally I was probably done. And, um, you know, even then I tried to meet with my my bosses or the, my bosses saw it too. They saw the burnout and they're like, you need to slow down. And finally, I just said, you know, the only way for me to quit this cycle is I need to leave here because you guys can tell me to slow down, but I won't. It's my personality. I'm not going to slow down because I feel like I can run the show and I can do it. And I've done it for you for so long that you just telling me to slow down isn't going to quit this cycle. So I ultimately had to quit. And when I went into the next job, I was like, I'm going to take a step back. I'm just going to be a sales rep and that is it. And then once again, found myself in the same flipping position. But at that point, um, I'd already made up in my head that I was quitting my job, but that took seven years in that time to decide that I was quitting my job. And that's, it's one of the things, again, that we talk about success, right? So if you're driven, it's really hard to just do the bare minimum because that's not what makes you successful in your own mind. It's not what's driven you to be successful in the past. <clears throat> so again, going back to my life. So when I was in college, I was really lucky, like I said. So James had a nursery and landscaping business. The economy took a hit. So then he started working um, for a very well-known horseshoe down here. So he was driving down first. The, and the guy told me, he's like, you got to go to shooting school. So I'm driving north to go to college. James driving south to go to shooting school. And then um, he got a good job working for him, but they were working. Like I would drop James off at 5.30 in the morning at a Denny's where, they, where the guy would pick him up. And uh, James also not a morning person. So <laughs> he dropped him off at 5.30 in the morning. I'd head off to school. James would go, sh or actually usually I'd come and clean pens and feed the horses, ride some, then I'd head to school. Or I was also still working for, I was working for Rain Cow Horse Trainer at the time too. So we had like seven different things going on 
and you're hustling and grinding because you think you're going to get ahead. And we did like, but I think about those days now, like I dropped James off at five 30, I'd pick him up at seven or eight o'clock at night. And then he comes shoe horses here at the ranch. I was like, how was your, I was like, Oh, it was a nice day today. He's like, I wouldn't know. I never looked up. And, you know, uh, and it's just, it, but it's one of those things where it's like you, you know, and then we'd, you, then you'd have this burnout where we'd have to like sit on the couch for like four hours that night and just <sighs> decompress from the day because we were both going a hundred miles an hour in 15 different directions all day. It wasn't worth it. Yeah. I mean, in the long run it was, but you can't sustain that for more than a little bit at a time. Well, it um, definitely takes its toll on you. Brennan and I had that conversation a couple months ago because I feel like our, well, our life feels a little weird right now because I feel like we're just compared to always being in high gear, just going and going and going. Since we've been back in Minnesota, it just feels like not that we're coasting because we're not those type of people, but I, it's just a, a slower pace. I feel like Remy and I, we're not used to that. Um, we're used to keeping really weird hours. We're used to, I'm not used to jumping in the truck, but Brandon is, I mean, it's nothing for Brandon to leave our house at nine o'clock on a Tuesday night and drive all night to get somewhere the next morning and then turn around and come home. I, it just, that's who we are. And that's how we've always done life. And somebody needed a trailer from us. Um, cause they were going to a show and they had to borrow our trailer. And they showed up after working all day at like 930 at night. And then they were going home, packing the trailer and leaving for their show. And it was a couple, it was probably five, six hours away. And they pulled out of the driveway. And I said to Brandon, I'm like, oh my God, I'm so glad that I'm not them right now. I'm like, how do they, I might've said like, I couldn't do that right now. And he's like, but we do do that. He's like, we'll do anything it takes to make it. And I'm like you're right he's like that's what they're doing whatever it takes so we get that so we get that a lot right man i don't know how you guys do it is a comment we get from most people i, I don't know how you do it i don't know any other way to do it there is no other way to do it right yeah. so we're gonna do whatever it's uh like we tried to reshoot this episode last night we couldn't because james worked all day with our guy trying to haul manure okay well the tractor got too hot so then we needed to finish last night which means that we finished around nine o'clock last night and then we made dinner and ate and watched some trashy TV and went to sleep. <laughs> like, I but it, do. you know, but it's one of those things, right? Where you, when people ask you how you do it, I don't know. And I don't know how to live in a different way. Right. I but wish I could be right. That seems normal for us. It is normal. And I think part of it, we talked about, mm -hmm. you and I have talked about it privately. We've talked about it a little bit on here. We thrive in the chaos, right? We like it. There's another thing I was talking to a friend of ours from Wyoming and he was saying he had a really big deal go through and uh, he was talking and he should have been very happy. And he was talking to a friend, another friend of his he goes, man, I don't know why I'm let down. And the guy's like, it's the adrenaline rush. And it's true. So when you thrive on chaos and you're always chasing success, no matter how much success you have, you don't rest, right? You're always chasing it. Again, that bar keeps jumping and jumping. And even if it's in your own head, you keep set, you keep setting a higher bar you're always in flight mode. You're always chasing success. You're always chasing adrenaline and you don't realize it until like you have a second. And that's why for that's us, where I'm at right now. Okay. So that's why, and you know what? I will be honest as horse trainers, the summer is always the worst. Cause you think it would be better. You think people would come. No, to it's more. the downtime. It's the downtime for us, right? Like it's yeah. like late fall through early spring is our heavy time. And, uh, because for us, it's too hot in California or people go on vacation. So we're still busy. We're just not as busy. And then it makes you start to question yourself. If you're used to just rolling and rolling and rolling and rolling, when you have downtime, you're like, what did I do wrong? What is not going right right now? And, and the other thing for us, we're also coupled with a, a bad drought out here. So we just have less cow stuff to do. And then you go out there and stare at dry fields and you're like, well, this sucks. So it's hot. You have... I'll, you say, I say I have less business and then we had like five new horses come in last week. Right. But it's one of those things where you're just like, Oh man, I messed up somewhere because you're used to the adrenaline. Like you're used to chasing it. You're used to like working 18 hours a day, which is not good for anybody, 
but at least I'm a creator. So for yeah. me, it's like I'm trying to work on things with our business and nobody's getting back to me. And so then I feel like I need something to happen. I need, I need to be creating something all the time. I need, I like that though. I thrive on it when it's chaos around me and I look out of control. That's usually when I'm the best. <laughs> and I think it's one of those. So, you know, you talk about that brain and doesn't look worried. I don't worry in the same way as James. So to the outside world, it doesn't look like I'm not worried. I worry. I just have faith. It's going to come back together. So yeah, but it is James lean on you to be the stronger one for him. I, I, it's not, I think that it's, he, he worries way more and I'm like, Oh, we'll persevere. And he's like, but how? And I was like, I don't know. We always have. And it's not, I don't know. I do know. We work hard. We put our heads down. It comes yeah. together, but He's an outside worrier versus where I'm like, oh, shit, this is not good right now. That's okay. Well, but it's okay. Like, that's just, it's not my style. And I think part, like, the joke is as a horse trainer, my superpower is to not be emotional on horses. I'm kind of that way about worrying too. I'm like, oh, you know, we'll come through it. Because for me, I don't need to get caught up in the day-to-day -day actions of how are we going to get through it. It'll come together. We'll work hard. Something always happens. And if it's a failure, well, this isn't the end. And uh, it's just, you know, the other thing, like we talked about, if you have a nine to five and look, there's a lot of people that really don't want to have the burden of their own no. business. Yes. Right. Yeah. But the other thing is you can't give everything to a nine to five because no matter what, you don't have ownership of that. Right. You don't have ownership of it. So if you're going to break your back, break your back for you. Yeah. You know, and we'll talk about success again next week and what it looks like, what it looks like to be suffocated by success, because that happens too. you get everything you wish yeah. for. And then you're like, oh, that was a lot. I should have wished for maybe less. But and then the happened? failure we can talk about. Yeah, and like, we're going to talk about failure. failure. But the, other, the other thing is what we'll talk about next week, too, is if you're going to fail. And this is where I was lucky. Right. I had my parents to back me. I had James working really hard. I worked really hard. So I, I didn't rest. You know, I wasn't coasting on other people doing things for me. I was working hard. But I think I've never been afraid to fail epically, right? If you're going to fail, commit to I the have. failure. Yeah, I see, I, I'm not afraid. I'm like, if I'm going to fail, I am going down in flames. Like, I'm going to jump for something so big because if you're going to fail and feel bad about failing, I feel bad about failing. I don't dwell on it for a long time. But if you're going to feel bad about failing... Make that feeling bad worth it, right? Well, don't, I, I don't feel bad because you missed one step. Like jump for the whole staircase and then feel bad that you failed. Well, I can talk about my um, fear of failing and how I've overcome it because I think that there are ways that you can condition yourself to think differently about it. So, and um, can I just say that today was very monumental <laughs> for many reasons. Uh, A, we redid this and it was so much better than yesterday. So much better. I hope nothing goes wrong between now and the time that I press end on this and then we get it uploaded because <laughs> it was really, 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 really good. B, we had total uninterrupted internet service on my end today. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. The internet gremlins weren't here uh, to get me. Um, so yeah, no, today was really, really good. Uh, I'm glad that we redid it. I'm glad that Rumi got up at 4.30. Um, I, I think it's funny we went live again, not on purpose. Also, um, no, I, and I wasn't just really trying are. to end the conversation, although we are going to try and make them shorter. I want, if you, if you guys have any questions, you could reach out. I talked to someone that had some questions yesterday for like an hour while I was cleaning stalls. Yeah. Um, but you know, I, I want you guys all to think about when you're thinking about success, it is small steps. Again, have grace and forgiveness for yourself because that's a big part of any sort of success, right? Be happy with what you have. You can always move forward, but be happy with that you have and look back at what you've done. That's you'll be surprised. You know, you'd be surprised at how far you've come because you feel like it's, it's not that far, but it, it is that far. And then like when people talk about how you get made by the struggle, we have a little bit of amnesia about how shitty it was. I don't, I remember how bad it was. So do I. You know, but like when people are like, oh, I'm successful. I'm like, yeah, of course you're successful now. But, and I'm not trying to be like flippant about it, 
but it sucks when you're in that struggle because you can't see a way out sometimes. Like you really, you're like, is, is this all for nothing? Again, am I supposed to persevere or am I supposed to give up? And I think that I'm just not smart enough to give up a lot of times. I think it's just who we are. Um, yeah, maybe we're so stubborn that we're going to figure the new paths out, you know? Yeah. It's just like this. It's just no different than what we're doing here. But uh, we, our goal was to keep these at an hour. And we're at an hour and five minutes right now. So I feel like another success. Uh, we did come up with a hashtag that is kind of gonna, going to be our slogan. And that would be, be bold. Be brave. Be humble. Um, once again, we are not going to be doing the lives anymore. That is because we're going to hit the right button. I don't know. Yeah. We're going to try not to do the lives anymore. We're not really sure if we're live right now or this is recording. Um, but anyhow, uh, we're going to try to drive all of our traffic to YouTube, Apple music, Apple podcasts, Amazon music and Spotify. There we go. Gosh, what a tongue twister. (laughs) Um, we also have a website, The Everyday Cowgirl, which you will be able to find all of the past and um, past and current episodes uploaded to that as well. So we look forward to seeing everybody next week. We will be continuing our conversation about success. Um, look and if you guys to- have questions about success, reach out. Um, both of us are on social media. You can follow us on Coffee with Cowgirls, but personally, you can reach out to us as well. Yeah. Have a great week, everybody. Bye, Remy. Bye.